Did you know that butterflies taste with their feet? <laughs> or that in ancient Greece the word for a butterfly was the same as the word for a soul, psyche? Or that there are 59 species of butterfly in the UK at the present time? I didn't. I didn't know anything about butterflies until a few years back. Like most people, I had childhood memories of a, a garden full of butterflies or walking through fields of them on holiday, but, well, I didn't take much interest. They were just there, part of everyday life. Hmm. No, I came to it late. Not too late, I hope. These belonged to my grandfather, my father's father, Frank. I never knew him. He died before I was born, killed in the war. No medals, not a hero. But this is his collection, or what's left of it. Getting on for a, a hundred years, many of them now. Outlived him by a fair stretch, so to speak. Ah. There is life after death for them. In a way, I suppose. Just as well for some of them, because there's no life at all now. Extinct, I mean. Take this one. The Checkered Skipper. First discovered in England in 1798. Extinct by 1976. I was 16 then, more interested in chasing other things rather than butterflies. Huh. You can still see it now in Scotland. It wasn't discovered there till 1941. A bit slow up there. Huh. Yeah, I wonder if it'll last as long as his English cousins. Uh, 178 years. They're putting it back now, down in the Midlands, where Grandfather caught these, restoring the habitat that was destroyed. So there are good people about, doing good things. Just not enough of them. Outnumbered by the rest of us. Humans, I mean. We're the ones that have done all the damage. Something has to be done. I have to check these regularly now. Top up the chemicals. Keep the bugs out. When I first opened these drawers, it was like a war zone. Headless corpses, bits of body everywhere, broken wings, and moulding labels on pins identifying the little piles of dust and what they had been. <laughs> ah. Ah. Museum beetles and damp. That was the cause. I had to throw a lot away. I salvaged what I could. Bought a new cabinet, put the chemicals in. Luckily I have easy access to them from work. Hmm. Of course, the chemicals they used to use in the old days are banned now. Carcinogenic. There. That's a nice tight fit. Hmm. Nothing will get in there. Or if it does, well, it won't last long. My mother had to go into a care home a few years after father died and there was an awful lot of clearing out to do before we could sell the old house. An attic crammed full of stuff and a garage, what my father had always called a storeroom. <laughs> I don't think I'd ever seen a car. So much stuff. The cabinets were right at the back of the garage under some old boxes. 
Mother had no idea what was in there, <laughs> when it hadn't been touched for years. And I don't think even Father would have known what most of it was, apart from the cabinets. When I saw them, I had a sudden flash of memory back to when I was little at Grandmother's house. She still lived in the Midlands back then, so, well, we didn't see much of her. But I suddenly remembered a visit when I found the cabinets in a back room. And when I opened the drawers, my jaw dropped in amazement at these beautiful creatures as brightly coloured, as detailed, and as pretty as jewels. But then Father came in, shouted at me, and told me to get out. <laughs> I thought at the time it was because he was cross with me. I thought that I might break the glass and damage them. Now, look at these jewels. The blues. The chalk hill blue like aquamarine. Common blues, the holly blues. And look at the undersides. The way the little black dots are painted as if by mathematical precision. And here, under the magnifying glass. Now, look at the perfect symmetry of those dots. And can you see, right down in the bottom edges of the underwings. In the orange dots, there's little silver blue studs. The silver studded blue. Plebeius Argus. I'm showing off now, aren't I? <laughs> but before I started any of this salvage operation, well, I wouldn't have been able to tell a difference between a silver studded blue and a blue bottle. <laughs> but I've learned a lot. Many of these little fellows would have grown up with ants as their friends. Several of the blues secrete a honeydew liquid as caterpillars, which attracts certain species of ants to feed on the honeydew, and in return, the ants protect the caterpillars from their predators. Sometimes they even take them down into their nests. Unfortunately for the ants, the large blue decided to repay them by becoming carnivorous and eating some of the ant grubs. That particular butterfly joined the chequered skipper on the extinction list in 1979. We had introduced myxomatosis to cull the rabbit population, and as a consequence the grass grew too long, the ants couldn't survive, and the butterfly died out. If there's one thing I have learnt, it's that things can't survive on their own. In nature, everything is joined up. Luckily, the good people are putting the large blue back where it belongs, in the southwest. Hmm. You won't find any silver studded blues up here though. I'm surprised you'll find them anywhere. There was a collector back in the 1880s who took 500 specimens in one season from one location. Hmm. They used to do that back then. Hmm. They did in grandfather's time too. Well, that's how he got these. How he became interested. Yeah, he got a job when he came back from the First War on a large estate for some lordship. He'd been a, a sort of mechanic before the war, uh, and then because of his knowledge of guns, he was useful on the big shoots. This was down on the Midland Moors. Hmm. When I found the cabinets, there was a load of old books and papers in boxes on top. Grandfather used to keep, here we are, a, a log book, yeah, recording all of the things that were killed on the big shoot days. Here. 
Grouse, 323. Pheasants, 151. Woodcocks, 24. Snipe, 5. Rails, 14. Oh, and then down the bottom, we've got the fur as opposed to the feather. <laughs> Two fox, 13 hare, 21 rabbits. Hmm. And it wasn't just the so-called game that they were after either. No, here we are. Buzzards, 5. Harriers, hen, stoke, marsh, 3. Peregrine, 1. Peewits. 22. Pigeons, 56. And there's even a night jar. That sort of thing still goes on today with what's left. <laughs> ah, the shooting, the trapping, the poisoning. But when they had finished with the big creatures, then they turned their attentions to the small ones, the butterflies. Grandfather used to look after his lordship's cars as well as his guns, his automobile collection. He used to drive him around. His lordship would go on butterfly hunting expeditions to all different parts of the country. He wanted to have the biggest collection to outdo Lord Rothschild. <laughs> oh, some hope. The big thing then was to find species aberrations. So you'd have to catch and kill everything to check if it was typical or an aberration, the VAR. The catching and killing was grandfather's job and his lordship would sit in the back of the car and sort through the specimens. Hmm. Hmm. I used to have a friend who was a stamp collector. It was the same thing. It was the aberrations that excited him. There was a, um, a Winston Churchill one, commemorative, that had a wonky line, I think, and, uh, and there was a 1966 World Cup winners one that had something wrong with it. And he told me about a stamp from a South Pacific island that had a, a mistake in the colouring and it sold for £20,000. <laughs> hmm. Well, butterflies used to be bought and sold at auction, but I don't think they ever reached that sum. Hmm. And they're not mistakes in butterflies. Well, not in the same way. Genetic variations, evolutionary adaptations. Oh yes, <laughs> there's a lot to learn. Hmm. It's a bit of a paradox, really. It, it seems obscene to us now to think of those Victorian and Edwardian collecting parties going out and systematically catching every butterfly almost just after it had hatched. Hundreds at a time they bagged. But those collectors who filled drawer after drawer with the same species and their aberrations were actually gathering the scientific material to advance the learning. The very fact that there were hundreds at a time seems unbelievable nowadays. Those were the days of plenty. Can you imagine a cloud of butterflies so thick that it actually obscures the sun? Or a fog of yellow and white butterflies stretching out over a mile coming in from the sea. Mm. Well, that used to happen. Mm. It must have seemed like there was a plentiful supply. But today, that supply is not there. And there's less time to discover what we don't know. 
those collector entomologists did reduce the supply dramatically and they did cause local extinctions in some areas but we now know that there were other factors are other factors I'd like to have known my grandfather. He got interested in butterflies, going on his lordship's expeditions. A bit like me, he knew nothing to begin with, but then he became fascinated, drawn into a world of colour and shape and pattern. He wrote that in one of his notebooks. Hmm. Everything I know about my grandfather has come out of those boxes of books and papers I found in the garage. My father would never talk about him. Whenever I asked, he would always change the subject to leave the room. Mother wasn't much more forthcoming, and I was never quite brave enough to ask grandmother. All I knew was that his name was Frank, and he was killed in the war. Sometimes, my sister Jane and I would make up stories about him to fill in the gaps. Perhaps he was a, a secret agent or a spy who had been captured by the Germans and tortured, but he would never talk. And then he made an escape and had to live a whole new life under a secret identity, so we could never see him. But he wasn't. Now, prepare yourselves for the biggest and most beautiful British butterfly. You'll know it from greetings cards and calendars, placemats and crockery. The Swallowtail. These were caught by my grandfather at Wickham Fen in Cambridgeshire in 1928. You can still see them on a few of the Norfolk broads now, but they disappeared from most of the fens when they were drained. Fens and mosses drained. Meadows ploughed. Hedges pulled up. Woods felled and then neglected. Roads and rails ripping through downland and ancient forests. Huh. Those that the collectors didn't get we're determined to finish off, it seems. There was another butterfly that shared its habitat with the swallowtail, and in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, the fire butterfly, as it was then called, was a common sight across the fenlands of the eastern counties. It became a favourite of the collectors, so much so that a thriving trade grew up with the locals who would offer hand-picked caterpillars for sale by the dozen <laughs> to the rich visitors from the south, which they usually were. Now, this pair here were given to Grandfather by his Lordship Rejects from a collection he'd bought at auction. But at that stage, Grandfather was an enthusiastic beginner in the collecting game. So I'm sure he would have been very grateful and highly delighted to have this male and female, though they were damaged, in his collection. An extinct British butterfly. The Large Copper. The last one was taken at Bottisham Fen in 1851 by a Mr. Wagstaff, apparently. But by then, what the collectors had started, the drainage engineers had finished. And all of the Fenland habitat of the large copper had been drained. 
to be put to better use. Hmm. I suppose that's the same better use that has turned all of our meadows into flowerless prairies. Hmm? I'm thinking about it. Well, the rainforests are, are better used to plant palm oil trees for shampoo and things, and soya beans to feed cattle, aren't they? And anyway, what does a, a, a butterfly or a, or a bat or a newt matter? Hmm? Surely the, the whole of the planet is just there for our better use. I don't blame Grandfather for what he did. Something has to be done. The large coppers had died out before he was born, and then it was the turn of the Mazarin Blue. That went before the First World War. But the black veined white, well, that didn't disappear until the mid-1920s, when Grandfather was still collecting. So perhaps that's what did it. Hmm? There's a pair of them in the collection. They were caught in an orchard in Worcestershire. Just two of 37 Grandfather took that day. His lordship was keen to add to his collection before the butterfly was no more. There were already rumours circulating of its demise. Huh. It was one of the first British butterflies to be described and named back in the early 1600s. It was plentiful through the 18th and into the 19th century, but two years after Grandfather took his, it was gone. Butterfly expeditions to favourite locations in Worcestershire and Kent yielded none. So his lordship had to make do with just one draw fill and no aberrations. Will you miss them when they're all gone? When they're part of a history, a vanished past, an elusive memory for your grandchildren to question you about. Very soon, you may not have the answers for them. I'd like to have sat on my grandfather's knee and asked him questions, and listened to stories of the chalk downs in summer, becoming a fluttering, shimmering sea of Adonis chalk hill, silver-studded blue of sunlit coppiced woodland glades, dancing with fritillaries and admirals and emperors, and of fragrant meadows alive with skippers and coppers and tortoise shells, both large and small. I'd have asked him if he could remember where he caught every butterfly and how difficult it was. Did he have to chase the fritillaries far? Did he have to climb the trees to get to the hair streaks, or get wet in the bogs looking for the heaths, or bitten by ants trying to find a large blue? <laughs> I'd like to have known which was his favourite butterfly, and I would have asked him why he had to kill so many, and what did it feel like? But I couldn't, because he was killed in the war. People don't collect butterflies anymore. Well, it's gone out of fashion and for some species it's illegal, which is a good thing, though it wouldn't stop a determined collector. But that's not the danger now if it ever was. You see, my grandfather didn't know what we know now. We know why extinctions are happening, and it's not because of the collectors. 
We have all of the learning and the science telling us what is happening and we are watching it happen. But my grandfather, so ignorant and then so entranced by the quarry he was pursuing, started to put two and two together by what he saw happening. Surely this onslaught, year after year, would eventually mean that species after species would become extinct. His notebooks started to question what was happening and his part in it. His delight at catching a new variety or discovering a vibrant new colony, well, that was starting to give way to the realisation that this annual slaughter he and others were exacting upon these beautiful creatures would mean surely that their survival was threatened. He started to get darker in his thoughts and become more disturbed, it seems. He even started to evoke his wartime experiences. Nine of us at the mast oaks today, armed with high nets and kite nets, standing in a line three or four yards apart. As the sun hit the canopy, the emperors started to come over the tops. Each one was netted and brought down. Must have been over 200 by the end of the day. The trenches were full of bodies, dark purple wings, the colour of blood. I felt sick. The generals were pleased. The generals, their lordships, standing back from the front line with their tablecloth picnics and champagne. The emperors, purple emperors, the most enigmatic and prized of all British butterflies. Admired for the tenacity they have in defending their treetop territories against even passing birds. There are other notebook entries showing Grandfather's change of heart from enthusiastic collector to compromised assassin. Here is an advert taken out of a an entomological paper. Wanted to purchase 20 gross of Scotch Argus in good condition, either alive or set. And underneath he has written 2,880 with five exclamation marks, followed by something has got to be done. The Scotch Argus, referred to in that cutting, is now called the Northern Brown Argus, and what we know as the Scotch Argus is confined in England to just a couple of colonies, both under threat. Grandfather caught his at Grassington in Yorkshire. It's no longer there. It would be a shame if it went the same way as the chequered skipper. And it has a cousin, the mountain ringlet, our only montane species. It's found on some of the Scottish mountains and it has a, a toehold in England on some of the high Cumbrian fells where its wild habitat is gradually being tamed and the warming climate is forcing it further up the mountainside to the point of no return. Grandfather was right. My father died quite suddenly, a heart attack. So if I had thrown away all of that junk in the garage, the cabinets of half disintegrating insects and the, the boxes of fusty old books and newspaper cuttings, then I wouldn't have known anything about butterflies. Or about Grandfather, his story, the family secret. 
Reading his notebooks, it's clear that something was happening to him. The disillusion he felt with the summers of butterfly collecting was growing into something much bigger. He no longer shared his employer's excitement and enthusiasm for the hunt. And his collection, well, there was nothing added to that after 1931, it seems, but he continued for another four years to follow orders, as he put it. As the general, no longer referred to as his lordship, tried in vain to catch Lord Rothschild's collection. <laughs> His wartime in the trenches starts to become mentioned more, alluded to, almost as if he saw a parallel between the wholesale destruction of the butterflies and the senseless human slaughter he had witnessed. But that didn't help him at the trial. Luckily for him, the breach jammed. And he was overpowered by a gamekeeper before he could fire a second shot. His lordship was shocked, but unharmed. So it was attempted murder, no death penalty. Grandmother and my father, who was only four at the time, had to get out of the cottage. His lordship gave them a week. Grandmother wanted to escape the scandal, so she moved away from the area. She took the cabinets with her, and the shame which she passed on to my father, who shouted at me when I opened the cabinets as a child in case I let the secret out. But he never lied to me. Grandfather's name was Frank, and he was killed in the war. When a bomb fell on the prison he was serving his sentence in. Ironically, <clears throat> His lordship stopped collecting a year later. Lord Rothschild had died, so the competition was over. Grandfather died in the war. No medals. But to me, he was a hero. Because he knew something had got to be done. <laughs>